Well, hello, and welcome to another episode of the Legal Gym Podcast. Thank you so much for joining me today, where we are going to be talking about how to handle chargeback disputes. Now, for the show notes for today's episode, which are going to include all the links and resources to everything that I'm going to be discussing today, make sure you head over to hawthornlaw.net slash 005, and you're going to get all the information we talk about today. Make sure you check that out. Let's go ahead and dive in to chargebacks. Here's some of the things we're going to be talking about. We're going to be talking about... What exactly is a chargeback? We're going to be talking about why it's important to deal with chargebacks, and we're going to be talking about some examples as well as some of the key ways that you can avoid chargebacks in the future and respond to them if and when you do get a chargeback. So let's start with what exactly is a chargeback. A chargeback is the payment amount that is returned to a debit or a credit card after a customer disputes the transaction, or sometimes they just return the purchased item. Now, that's the, the easy way to say it, but it, it's a little bit more nuanced. It's a little bit more complicated than that. And my take on this is that chargebacks are, frankly, incredibly scary, especially if you're talking about a high ticket charge. And these can be scary in a number of different ways. Now, as an example, very publicly, I'm not saying this is this is not uh, any private information, but Ali Bjork, who is the creator of the Tiny Offer Lab, I believe, she created that Tiny Offer Lab after she received a $6,000 chargeback from one of her one-to-one clients that she had been working with. That is a huge amount of money for almost anybody who is in business, and to have that amount come out of your bank account after you had been relying on those funds, maybe you had already spent those funds, that can be an incredibly traumatic experience. And personally, I've also dealt with clients who have been threatened with chargebacks or have actually had chargebacks happen and these are just, they're just not fun in any way because as I get it from a customer's perspective, sometimes you feel like you didn't get what you paid for and so you just want to initiate a chargeback. But from the merchant perspective, if you are relying on that revenue and somebody has already paid you and you have a contract with that person and the person is looking to basically breach a contract by initiating a chargeback, that can be incredibly scary. And and these are things that should be taken very seriously. It's not something that you should just roll over and say, okay, we're going to accept the chargeback. These are, these are things that, that you need to look very closely at. Now, chargebacks as an online business owner can cost you thousands of dollars. So it is important that you have a process in place to not only deal with the chargeback when they happen, but also to prevent them from happening in the first place. Now, if you get a chargeback, I want you to understand your bank account is going to be debited right away. And it can take months for you to get that money back, even if you win the dispute. So it's better to try and prevent that dispute from happening in the first place or to try and resolve the dispute with the customer so that you don't have to go months without those funds. Now, before we get too much into this, I want to take a brief break to give you my legal disclaimer, which basically is that I'm a lawyer, but I'm not your lawyer. And nothing I say in this episode today should be construed as legal advice of any kind. If you'd like to hire me or my law firm to help you with your legal needs, then you would need to enter into an employment contract with our firm. And typically that involves giving us lots of money. So if you'd like to do that, we're more than happy to help you out. Just go to hawthornlaw.net and you can look at the different ways that we can work with you and your business. So now that we got that out of the way, back to the episode. So let's start at the very beginning here. When it comes to dealing with chargebacks, the best way to deal with chargebacks is for there not to be a chargeback to begin with. And that's going to start with clear communication with the client or the customer. And if you are someone who has a high ticket item, it's going to be a lot easier to be clearer in your communication with that customer because you're dealing with them typically in a one-to-one basis. But if you've got some if you're someone who is doing a volume business, maybe you're charging a low-end membership and you've got hundreds of clients that you're dealing with or customers that are that are involved in your membership, it's going to be much more difficult to have that communication with that that customer because you're not necessarily going to know who that customer is. You're not going to know what's going on in their life. You're not going to understand why they initiated the chargeback. Now, maybe there's going to be a paper trail. Maybe there isn't going to be a paper trail. But when you're dealing with many customers in, in that fashion, it's going to be that much more important that you have a clear and explicit policy on how you're going to deal with chargebacks if and when they come through. And this all starts with a clear an explicit refund policy that you are typically going to include in your terms of sale. So if you don't have a contract with the people that are purchasing from you, now is the time to get one. This is going to be incredibly important 
if you do not have a contract, you're going to lose your chargeback dispute every single time. So you must make clear not only what your refund policy is, but you also need to make sure that you explain that refund policy and that it is crystal clear with the client what that refund policy is. So if you if you have a cancellation policy or a cancellation procedure, you need to make sure you're clear with the client or the customer about what that cancellation procedure is and how it's going to happen. And under what circumstances, the customer might be entitled to a refund. If you're wondering why so many online vendors who sell courses and products online uh, have a no refund policy, zero tolerance policy when it comes to these things, it's because of chargeback requests. And, and it's a lot easier to say no refund at all and make that crystal clear over your entire sales page and everywhere where you do business with somebody that you do not have a refund policy in place, that there is no refunds, all sales are final. If you make that crystal clear, you're going to win a lot more of those disputes. If you have more of a, well, there is a refund policy, but you know it's within a certain number of days and you have to follow these procedures, it's going to be a lot harder to win those chargeback disputes. What to do if you do get a chargeback uh, request? Number one, don't freak out. It's not the end of the world, but you do want to make sure that you have sufficient funds in your bank account to cover the chargeback because if you have not already noticed the funds come out, the funds are going to be coming out. The merchant is going to, to take those funds out of your bank account and they're going to give a temporary credit to the customer pending the outcome of the dispute. So you need to make sure you have funds in your bank account to cover the amount of the dispute. Not only that, you need to have funds in your bank account to cover the amount of the dispute and the fees that you had to pay to the merchant provider for the charge because you have to pay those back as well to the merchant provider. So for example, if you're talking about a $1,000 product and you had to pay a 3% uh, service fee to the credit card processor for that $1,000 product, then you might have received $970 in your bank account after all is said and done. But when you're doing the refund, you're going to be paying back that $1,000 to the customer plus the $30 that you had to pay in service fees to the vendor. And you're like, well, why do I have to do that? Well, it's because the vendor is looking at this from the standpoint that they didn't do anything wrong. So they shouldn't lose their fees because they process the transaction. So even though they have to give all the money back to the customer, they want to keep their fee. And so you have to pay them back their fee as well. So the second thing you need to do is you need to, to research the reason for the chargeback because how, why the customer initiated the chargeback is going to dictate how you need to respond. Now, there can be a number of different reasons for a chargeback request. And I'll include a link in the show notes episode to a page from Stripe. Most people who are doing business online these days have a Stripe account. And so there is actually a, a special page that talks about how to, dis to handle disputes within the Stripe docs and some of the, the, the main reasons why a credit card or why a um, customer might initiate a dispute could be credit not process, which basically means the customer was entitled to a refund. You didn't give them the refund, so they initiated a chargeback. A duplicate charge, which is exactly what it sounds like. A, a customer was charged twice for something. A fraudulent charge, uh, which is basically where the customer didn't authorize the charge. There's a general category. There's a product not received category, a product unacceptable category. Uh, and and so a subscription canceled uh, category and an unrecognized category. So depending on why the customer initiated the chargeback, now why they initiated the chargeback and the category that's assigned to it might be different than why it actually was than the reason for the chargeback to begin with. So you might have a situation where a, a customer initiates a credit not processed chargeback, but in reality, maybe it was a duplicate charge. Or perhaps it was something where they were trying to cancel a subscription and, and they thought they'd get a refund, but that's not actually what happened. It's important to understand what the category of the dispute is because depending on that category, it's going to have an effect on how much evidence you need to prepare to respond to the dispute. So once you know the reason for the chargeback, um, the, the other thing that's important here is you might want to go back at this time and start researching what exactly happened. You might want to look at your communications with the customer, see if you have any e email communications. If, if you use a service like a Help Scout, that's going to be very helpful because then you can go in and you can see what, what communication you actually had with the customer um, or what, what communication the customer had with your customer service people to figure out what was going on with the transaction. 
if anything was promised to the customer or or something like that that you didn't necessarily authorize, that's going to be important. You also want to look at the, the customer's order history. You want to see you know, kind of what's going on with the customer. Is this a first-time customer? Is this somebody who's been with you a while? That might dictate how you're going to handle the chargeback. And then once you've got a good understanding of kind of what's going on with the customer, then you want to make note of the deadline to respond to the dispute. Now, typically, it's going to be within 30 days of the chargeback request. And and if you do not do anything after 30 days, then the chargeback is just basically going to be approved and the customer is going to win the dispute. And you don't want that to happen. You Even if you're going to agree to the chargeback request, like for example, so a couple months ago, I had a client initiate a chargeback and the money came through. And if she had just emailed me and said, hey, I would like a refund. We were going to give her the refund. So I didn't have any problem with the chargeback request, but it's still important to submit a response, letting them know, here's what happened. And we, we're going to go ahead and, and we're okay with this chargeback in this situation. So just because you get a chargeback doesn't mean you automatically are going to fight it. There might be situations where you're not going to fight it. And if that's the case, you still want to respond and tell the processor what's going on and why the chargeback was initiated from your perspective. That way you don't get your account flagged as, as someone who just gets a bunch of chargeback requests and doesn't respond to them. And uh, that, that could cause you problems with the merchant processor. So the next step of the process before you actually respond to the dispute, now you might want to start the process of preparing your response. We're going to talk about what you do and how you do that here in just a second. But before you do that, the fourth step is you want to actually reach out to the customer to determine if the dispute can be resolved. And so this might be you reaching out to them and offering them a special promotion or a credit on their account if they want to purchase something else from you or several months of free service or something else of value to the customer to see if you can somehow resolve the dispute and get them to actually withdraw the chargeback. Because if the the client is willing to withdraw the chargeback, that is going to be the fastest way to get those funds back in your bank account. So if this is like, like I said, a big customer, then you may want to see if you can negotiate something like that um, and at least get a partial refund. If you go to them and say, listen, we'd be willing to agree to this much as a refund, but we can't agree to the whole thing. I mean, maybe you're a service provider who provided the customer with a service and you did most of the work, but maybe you didn't finish all the work. And so they asked for a full refund as a chargeback and that's not appropriate. Um, Maybe you can get them to to cooperate and and agree to maybe you know a, a discount of 25% off the final fee because you did do a lot of work for them and if you can get them to agree to that then then they might be willing to release the chargeback for that partial refund so depending on how the the customer responds to you and i would recommend that you do all these that this should be in writing these these are not phone calls you should have with the customer because if you have phone calls with the customer then that's not something that you can submit as evidence if you need it in support of your dispute so if you have a an email back and forth and the customer says yeah i'll withdraw the dispute but then they don't withdraw the dispute then you at least have something in writing that says the customer said they were going to withdraw the dispute and then you can submit that as evidence in support of your contention that the dispute should be dismissed so then you decide well depending on how the customer responds, are you actually going to fight the chargeback or not? And as I mentioned before, regardless of what you decide, you're going to want to file a response. So if you are going to fight the chargeback, then you need to determine what evidence you need to provide. Typically, the type of evidence that you're going to provide are going to be copies of your contracts and your refund or cancellation policy. You may want to include an explanation of when the customer was provided the refund policy. This might be screenshots of your checkout page. You're going to include any client communications that you might have had with the client subsequent to the chargeback or maybe before the chargeback where you were informing them of your refund policy and and what was going on so that the customer knew. Because the other side of this equation is the customer, when they initiate the chargeback with the credit card company, they're basically telling the credit card company, yeah, this was not a valid charge. And um, and I have the legal authority to ask for a chargeback. And so they're, I, I don't want to say they're committing a crime, but I'll be honest, when I, if I see a charge that is not valid or that I don't think is valid on my credit card statement, I do everything I can to research that charge ahead of time to make sure I don't issue a chargeback on uh, something that was actually a valid charge because that actually is a criminal offense to charge something, get the product, and then issue a chargeback under false pretenses. that That's basically credit card fraud. So you want to make sure you have all the information you need in terms of evidence. The other thing you want to do is present your argument for why the customer is not entitled to a refund. 
And what I like to do is when you're submitting all this evidence, there's going to be different categories for the different types of documents that you can produce. And typically it's going to be either JPEGs or PDF documents that you're going to be uploading to the system. But then there's this, and, and you can only do one document per category, but then there's this catch-all other category. And what I like to do is draft a more substantive response to what happened, what the customer ordered, when they ordered it, how the customer, um, uh, why they're not entitled to the refund, and include all the language from the contract that basically outlines what the cancellation policy is, what the, the refund policy is, and why they're not necessarily entitled to a refund in this situation. And then you upload that as a response as well. Now, you can do all that, prepare that response, but, and upload it, but you don't have to submit it just yet. If you're using Stripe, the way Stripe will handle this, and, and different processors are going to handle this different ways, but but if you're doing this with Stripe and you upload all this information, don't submit it because what Stripe will do is they'll hold all the information and they'll submit it before the deadline if you don't do any take any further action. And so now let's say you, you prepared all this information, you uploaded it all to the, the, the management portal for the dispute, and then you reached out to the client and or the customer and, and asked them to withdraw the dispute for whatever reason. And now you're waiting on a response from them. And let's say, you know, time goes by and they don't respond. You don't want to forget about this. And so you can submit that when the time is right. Or if you get an affirmative response from the client, then you can change your response and then submit it. Or if you don't hear from the client at all and you, you wait right until the deadline, then you can submit all that. The, the paperwork will be submitted automatically at the deadline. So you don't have to worry about missing that deadline and having the dispute lost. All right. So I think this is a really important uh, topic to discuss. I'll probably do more episodes about this later because this is so relevant to anyone who's doing online business. But I do encourage you to take chargebacks very seriously. I know they're scary, but if you, you follow the proper steps and you follow a process, you can handle these and, and hopefully you can win some of these chargebacks as well. I know it seems like a daunting uphill task, but it is possible. All right, all you legal gym listeners, now that you know more about how to deal with chargebacks, you are ready to start implementing. Because if there is one thing we love to do over here at the legal gym, it's to take fast action. So if you haven't already, make sure to check out the show notes page for today's episode. You can get a rundown of all the links and resources we talked about here today by visiting hawthornlaw.net slash 005. That's going to be the home base for all of your legal and business tools and resources to help you start, build, and protect your online business. Thank you so much for listening. I look forward to seeing you in the next episode.